Peace, everyone. How you doing? Welcome to Black Intelligentsia. We're dealing with the Summer Empowerment Tour. And uh, right now I'm in Tallahassee, Florida. And I'm speaking with a gentleman here that you see on camera. I'm going to let him give you his name, credentials, and we're going to ask some questions. So let me see. Let me move it up some. All right, sir. How you doing? What's your name? Good, okay. I'm Dana Denar. Dana One of my Dinar. names. Also okay. known as also known as Baba Kamal. Okay. And I am a clinical psychologist by training, licensed in Florida as a clinical psychologist. And I've been a professor for almost 30 years. And uh, I'm also a person that has been involved in uh, running my own businesses since I left graduate school back in the 80s. Uh, I'm a filmmaker. I just finished my second feature film. It'll be out in the world pretty soon. And um, I'm also a yoga instructor. And I teach a lot of different techniques for people to uh, enhance their life through psychology, yoga, uh, meditation, different things. Okay. So, how many years you've been in your field? In psychology? Things? Yes. Hmm. Well, uh, I hadn't thought about that. How many years? Uh, I started as a drug counselor in 1972. 1972. 1972, before I went to school to become a psychologist. So I've uh, been counseling ever since 1972. Yeah. And uh, I went to grad school. I finished grad school in 1987. So I've been uh, licensed since the early, late 80s and uh, still practice. I still see clients, I'm a consultant, do a lot of different things. And mostly their work has been in Tallahassee? Or mostly, mostly in Tallahassee. I did, um, I ran a hospital in Los Angeles for a year and, uh, down in South Central LA. But the rest of the time, I've been here. Okay, so for those that may not know, who would you say is like your contemporaries? Those that... Well, I, um, I think of myself as a, a student of a number of people that have been instrumental in promoting what we would call now the African Center concept or African centering or African centered philosophy. Uh, and so um, the first person that I spoke with that had an influence on me was Naeem Akbar. And Naeem Akbar is ahead of me for several years, but you know, he had a great impact on my stop look and listen orientation that I have now. It made me really question what am I doing? Even in psychology, what am I doing? My first year in grad school was his first year here at Florida State. And um, Naeem said to me that year, he said, uh, you have to get two degrees while you're here. One degree you'll get papers for, they'll sign off on it, you'll say doctor. He said, but the second degree you won't get papers for. You have to do it yourself, but it'll be more important than the other degree. That's in African history and culture. So he kind of put me on that path to study African history and culture. And in doing that, I became uh, fascinated by a number of writers who were out there at the time sort of pioneering this new version of it because it's been around since the turn of the century, but this new version really got kicked off in the mid-70s, late 70s, and right when I was coming into grad school. And uh, so, uh, I'm, I'm highly influenced by, I'll say, uh, people like, uh, first of all, Dr. John Henry Clark, who is, uh, I consider him my number uno elder mentor, and uh, people like Amos Wilson, people like uh, Bobby E. Wright, people like um, Asa Hillier, uh, people like Wade Nobles, uh, Ashwa Kwesi, these are people that 
I met along the way that I spent a lot of time uh, talking to, influenced by, uh, kicking around different ideas. So these are these are my comrades in arms. Okay, okay. So in your studies and things, what was the main focus of the community that you really wanted to dive, dive into and look into more than others? Like, if you could put it one, two, three, your top three things that you focus on or thought needed to be looked at more than others. Well, it's kind of uh, it kind of happened in stages. Um, see, when I when I was I told you I was in L.A. for a year. So when I was in L.A., I lived there twice. But the second year, I was running the hospital in uh, down in South Central L.A. And um, the hospital was for substance abuse, and I had mostly black young people, crack addicts mostly. What year was this? This was like 1989. And uh, a lot of women in that program, and they're true. And um, so when I got there, one day they asked me to come and uh, run the group. And I said, okay. And so I did, and I asked them what they wanted to talk about. And a couple of issues came up, but the main one was suicide. And we did talk about suicide that day, but it did something to me. I and mean, I left that group, I walked out of there, uh, really that was the day that I found my purpose and uh, shifted my whole idea about what I was going to do with my time for the rest of my life. Because I focused on the fact that here I was with this program with all these young people that they were, they were just entering the prime of their lives. With all the potential and possibility of their lives, they could do anything. And all they could think about was dying. And uh, that just motivated me, and so I, I said, you know what, I've got to raise soldiers. That's what I said, it's like, I've got to raise soldiers. And I had someone here at the university that told me, he said, well, if you ever come back to Florida, I'll probably be needing to hire some people. So, look, you know, so I called them, told them, I said, I think I'm coming back. Uh, I got hired at FAMU. And that's why I came back to FAMU, uh, because it's a transient population of young people who are seeking and I came back to lay soldiers. That was the whole point. And so uh, when I came back, uh, looking at how I was going to interface with the community and what I could do, uh, I realized the most probably the most important issue for us is that we are ignorant of everything. We don't have information about very much and certainly not about our own history and culture. And I've been studying it, you know, now for what, probably 10 years at least at that point. So uh, the first thing we did, we opened a bookstore and uh, I had like a little, a little room that would hold maybe 100 people. And so the first thing I did was open the bookstore that was kind of like, that became kind of like the information center in the city, at least for black people. You know, and uh, we still have a bookstore next door right here. I still have it. Okay. Was this uh, in a uh, conjoint or agreement with Wade Noble's definition of culture? Well, well, um, we share a definition, right? Uh, which is much more focused on the psychology of a human being rather than the externalizing of it. You know, we talk about. Mostly we talk about culture as behavior, usually. Like people talk about things like, well, it's how you talk, it's what you eat, you know. But these are all superficial aspects of culture, you know. Uh, what Wade talks about culture as a crucible of uh, information processing, that's what culture is. So, and we, and we look at it as a response to essential human questions. And those essential human questions uh, start with definitions, like what is it? First question is what? What is reality? Why do you think that's what reality is? How is it defined? Who defined that reality? See, so when we study our own people and our own dialogue about being on this planet, we will see a philosophy of reality that comes from African people. And it doesn't matter where on Africa you go. So we're not talking about uh, ethnic differences. We're talking about a core idea of reality. 
that's shared on all over this planet. And so when you answer that question, well, what is it? Well, what is reality? That includes what am I as a human being? So like, what is a human being? Is it just because you have, you know, again, the parents, you got two legs, you got two ears, you know, you've got a, a certain statue, uh, you walk up, right? Is that what makes you a human being? No, we can always find examples of other things that can do that, so that can't be it. You can teach a bear how to ride a bicycle, like a human being, but that doesn't make him a human being, see? So there's something at the core of what a human being is. So once we know what that is, then it becomes um, how do you perceive in reality? So the second question is, you know, how do you behave? You behave in relationship to your perception of what reality is. You see? And that becomes what we call ritual and custom. Certain ways of behaviors we see among certain people, those people behave in those ways because of the culture. It's transmitted. And we, have, we even see with African American people, many times we see the behavior that people don't even know where the culture came from. They sometimes don't even notice it. You know? Would you say this brings They carry it on, though. Would you say this brings about a solidarity between those who have similar cultural uh, traits or characteristics from those perceptions? Well, well, culture, collectively, which is answering those three questions, what is it for, how do I behave as a third question, which is why? That's what we refer to as morality or moral domain, right? So. Unfortunately, one of our problems is that we keep operating out of our own moral demand and expecting everyone else to operate as if they have the same moral demand, but they don't. So we may ask the question, well, how could all those people go along with this crazy stuff, you know? And it's like, well, they're following a moral demand. Even if they don't notice, they're following a moral demand. So, Whatever we think is, quote, right or wrong is rooted in whatever we think it is and how we should respond. See? So those three together, that becomes the glue of any people. I don't care who it is. The people are defined by their culture. That's what makes them unique. That's what makes them who they are. So black people, we talk about blackness and black people. We're not talking about skin color, actually. It just so happens that that's one of the correlates. You see that. In other words, you show up with this color. With this color, but we're not really talking about color. We're talking about those internal, uh, many times very subjective and subconscious uh, constructs that run the life of the person. Which is now that's where the sharing is. The shared cultural experience. Intrinsic principles that that are there and in, they. In that are there and will operate unless something interferes with them, which is what we're dealing with, the interference. You know, Wade, you mentioned Wade, Wade has this, this construct he uses, which I, I like, where he says, um, you know, it's like if you can imagine we're a saltwater fish trapped in a freshwater tank. It's not enough substance in the water to sustain our lives. And a lot of times when we talk about soul brother, soul sister, that term soul is getting at that definition of something that is behind all this, that is a substance that is really not a part of this culture. Can we go into spirituality with this? Is this well, well spirituality is what it is. Although, again, because we have been hijacked, even the word spirituality, I almost hesitate to use it because... People think they know what that is, but I'm not sure that they do because we have a tendency to look at terms even. We don't look at the origins of these words, right? We use them and we don't look at the origin. So when we don't get the origin, we often miss the actual meaning of the word. Can you give me an example of how deep it goes? Almost everybody when you meet them will give you the greeting, hello. And people say hello back. And nobody even questions, what did I just say? And why is that the greeting? We went to school. We had a so-called education. We heard about root words. The root word of the word hello is hell. It's 
not much left after hell. It's just an O after that. So what does this word actually mean? And why has it become the greedy? You know, who greets people like that, you know? It basically says, you know, hell is all around us. That's basically what the word means. Now, why is that the greeting? But that's part of this culture, right? And people are part of this culture. It's not my culture. I don't come from a culture that says hell is everywhere. That's not the culture I come from. Well, the time frame... Follow what I'm saying? The time frame and the cultural context of it would be peace, brother. How you doing? Exactly. Exactly. Which is 180 degrees away from hell. Yeah. Right, see? So that's why I say that you can have a cultural heritage and yet have another culture imposed on it and have you living out somebody else's culture. And that's really our problem. That's the that's the freshwater tank problem that we have. Because we didn't we didn't understand that not everybody has the same culture. And how culture is essential. It's not just how you dress or how you speak. Those are after effects. So in your very first project dealing with books and stuff, how do you see books, or how did you see books being the primary thing that you wanted to sit down? Yeah, yeah, good question. So I had gone to, uh, the first time I went to LA, uh, I had gone through Texas and uh, I was in Houston, and I don't remember how, but I stopped off at the Shrine of the Black Madonna. And this way back in the 80s. And uh, I went into that bookstore, and uh, I was just fascinated. I mean, I had no idea that black people were producing that many books on all these different subjects that were related to us. No idea. And uh, when I got to Los Angeles, the two bookstores out there, I spent weekends many, many weekends at those stores. And um, I realized that, well, one of the problems that we have, the biggest problem probably, is that we really don't even know what happened. We don't have information about the world that we're in, and especially about our own world. We don't have that. So uh, that was the first thing. My first job is to begin to provide literature that people could go and study. Go study African history, culture. So that was the first one. Then also, with the room that I had, we had speakers, we had some rituals that we did, uh, different things that people weren't used to. Uh, and I still think that, to a great extent, that's still a great need. And, and, and especially, I mean, the school system is atrocious. There's never really been, at, at a public school level, uh, since the so-called integration period, there's never been really any real education for African-American people. So uh, that's still, you know, being in the dark leaves you vulnerable. And so that's still a, a big issue. But the next one, so that's how it started, right? But the next one became the idea of being in charge of your own world. So when I say entrepreneurship, that's what I'm talking about. I'm not just talking about making money. I'm talking about the reality of living on this planet is that as human beings, we have always created whatever we needed to survive and thrive on this planet. After this enslavement period, we lost our hold, our foothold on how to function on this planet. So now, in a very dependent orientation, we're constantly waiting or complaining and many times begging for our oppressors to act right and provide for us the things that we feel we rightly deserve. So what cultural context or verbiage best describes how we deal with that, black nationalism, some other term? Well, you know, I don't really deal with those terms, again, because people have different ideas about whatever they think those things mean and uh, how they respond to them. So I'd rather stay much more concrete with things like dependency versus not being dependent. 
like being innovative or not being innovative. Like being responsible for your existence or abdicating your responsibility for your existence. Proactive instead of Proactive reactive. instead of reactive, yes, exactly. Very, so some very essential things that we have to do that as a group we're not doing. And of course there are pockets of people that are. As a group, I'm saying we're we're still we're still in the in the plantation uh, hope hope master do right level at this point. See, so let me give you a couple of simple things. Like, I drive around. I when I'm with young people, especially you know college, really young college. People, I just look around. Like you can look in this room right here. See? On the one hand, we're saying uh, we're unemployed, right? I'm saying well, if you're unemployed, but you got to eat. You have to stay somewhere, protect your body at minimum. You're going to need water for sure. How can you be unemployed? See, everything in here, somebody had to make it. It didn't just pop up. Somebody had to put time in to make this table. Somebody had to put time in to make that plate, that silverware, this cup, that camera we're using. Somebody had to create that. It didn't come out of nowhere. Right? We are the inventors of almost everything that we take for granted for. What happened to our inventing process? Right? So this is what I mean about dependency. Sitting around waiting for life to get better. Versus simply creating a life that's better. It's in our hand at any moment. You know, I remember uh, many years ago, uh, there was this little show on, on television, and like many times they have these conversations about race, and they have a few 10, 15 people on these panels, and many things are discussed. Oftentimes, it's just a crazy argument between two sides that don't agree, which doesn't help. But uh, one of the interesting things that came up in that panel, Tony Brown was on that panel, Sister Soldier was on that panel. and. Uh, the question was raised, the day when Rosa Parks did not get up on that bus, what did we learn from that? You know, people had all kinds of things to say, and then Tony Brown just took it right to the, to the point. He said, what we realized that day is we could have been riding in front of the bus the whole time. And that's what I'm talking about. For me, it's all about being the way that I want to be, living the life that I choose to live, and creating that life regardless of the challenges that are in front of me. Nobody's going to tell me I can't live this life I'm trying to live, which is maybe a higher type of life than anybody expects or was relegated to the slaves, you know. I don't have to live that way, you see. I can choose to live the way that I choose to live. And if I embrace my own culture, there's certain things that are going to be a part of that, like other people probably not even going to be involved in because it's not a part of their culture. You see? So for 17 years, I ran a school, my own school. I created that school. I created the way that we taught the children. I based it on understanding African tradition. I based it on understanding the African definition of a human being. So we did things a lot different than what they do in public school. A lot of people were just were amazed at the performance of my children, yet they were frightened by the concepts that I used. I spent the first 45 minutes every morning doing nothing but rituals with my children. It didn't matter whatever the backgrounds were, we all did the same thing every morning, which included a little bit of meditation and yoga and different stuff that people don't know, know me doing in school. So was this to bring about solidarity and having everybody comfortable with being the same and doing similar and bring I don't I don't think right? I don't think there's one explanation or one definition. I think it's once we, once we understand this culture, and this culture is telling us that we are multi-dimensional, then a number of things have to be done. Right? But again, the definition of an education even, what is an education? You know, 
In the African tradition, the education is a process of initiation into the discovery of one's true self. That's what the whole process is all about. And on the way to that discovery, which also means understanding your power. Like, a human being is a collection of powers. Like, to understand that. And what type of things help the youth arrive at this point? Well, there, there are many things, there, there are many things, but what I remember even growing up in the black community when it was separate and unequal is that our teachers and, and administrators, they were all clear that what they were doing was social and spiritual. They were clear on that. And they approached us that way. So, for example, the idea of a student being considered disabled, unable to learn, I hadn't entered the world yet. We didn't have any of that. So we had no di learning disabled children. They didn't exist yet. We didn't have any hyperactive children when I grew up. I'm show you how deep it is. I was in fifth grade. That means I'm like 11 years old. All black school, all black faculty, in the hood. About 600 plus students in the school. Every day at 12.30, all the teachers got time off, 20 minutes, to go and do whatever they wanted to do. And they would usually go down to the teacher's lounge. So imagine, the whole school, 600 plus students, not a single teacher in any class. They're all down at the lounge hanging out for about a half an hour. It simply would tell one person in the class, say, you're going to be the monitor while I'm away. So you put your head down. You don't have to go to sleep. You can take, take a nap if you want to. But there'll be no talking for the next half an hour. And if there's a problem, I'll find out when I get back. And they tell the monitor, if you got to go to the restroom, just ask so-and-so. And then they would leave. So I went through that every day. Never had a problem. Didn't have no kid acting up. Didn't have no, I don't know how to stay in my seat. Didn't have none of that. A whole class of young people, a whole school of young people, that means all grades, from first grade up to sixth grade back in those days. No teacher, no adult supervising at all, and we supervised ourselves and had no problems. That's how far we have gone from where we were. That's culture. How can all of these students, all these children, know how to act with each other with peace and order without any adult supervision? That's culture. So in my school, we had to try to get all these children back to that understanding. See? So one of the things we did, we did these rituals we did. We also did this collectively in a circle, in the group. So at one point, I had 65 students. So in the morning, maybe outside, like in a huge circle, right? And all the things we did, so you have, you're teaching social skills, you're teaching young people to respect older people, and you're teaching teenagers to respect young people. So for example, we would, do, we would do proverbs. Every morning we did proverbs. We did proverbs. We say, okay, well, what does this mean? What, what's, what's the message here? So, you know, 15-year-olds got to listen to an 8-year-old description of whatever they think. It might blow your mind. Okay? So we had great respect among our students between them. We didn't allow no nonsense. We didn't allow no name calling. We simply let them know, no, here is a different world. I would have children come from public school and maybe the first couple of weeks they really had trouble adjusting because, you know, they weren't used to peace and they come in there acting crazy. I would sometimes literally take a child in my office and I would say, do you see any white folks in here? No, sir. I say, well then, you know you're in a different place, don't you? Yes, sir. Okay, we don't allow no foolishness up in here. So make an adjustment, because you're not where you've been. 
Sometimes that's all it would take. Click, that kid would instantly know what that meant. I ain't got to do no long explanation about slavery. And I ain't, I just got to, me, look, me and you, let's, let's deal right now. Soul to soul. It's not even about the fact that I'm the adult right now. It's about one human being to another human being. Soul to soul. You're in a different world. Act like it. That's all it would take. Some of them take more, but most of them, that's it. By the time these children spend this time together, they have a synergy that also operates so that they feel comfortable receiving criticism from their peers. No, don't do it like that, do it like this. Also giving a hand to their peers. We didn't allow nobody to mock anybody if they didn't get it. But we also, definition, we also told them that they were geniuses and we gave a definition of a genius and because of that, and because they had no reason to doubt it, when they had difficult situations, they simply worked on it, it increased their uh, frustration tolerance, we call it in psychology. Because now that they had a definition that they could buy into, uh, if the problem was hard, they would just simply work at it. Like, I know I can get this, I have to And we would tell them, oh, don't worry, just keep going, they'll get it. And they would, of course. So there is a a reciprocal relationship there that's missing in public school. A lot of our children go to public school and right, just because they show up right away, uh, they are perceived as unable to operate, unable to learn, or maybe they speak, um, you know, uh, we, we, we talked about um, language way back in the 60s, we've been known as Ebonics. 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 And so what Ebonics is, is we have a language process coming from our genetic inheritance so that certain words will sound different because the way our mouths are made and also the history of how we use language, right? So you'll notice it doesn't seem to matter whether it's north, south, east, west, you will hear among black people, they will drop certain sounds. So they'll say, who is that coming through the door? They don't say door. So who's that coming through the door? I'm going to the store. They don't say I'm going to the store. We say, do you mean store? Yes. They know what they're saying. But they naturally, in speaking, it's a linguistic structure of the mouth that's carried forth generation to generation. So we're speaking really in the African language pattern, but using English, which is not an African language pattern. So, almost all black children go to school and learn English as a second language. Grammar structure. Grammar structure, which is a second language for us. We don't speak like that. Like, you'll notice how we say, uh, you'll see children say, say, what you be doing? They'll say it like that. What you be doing? And maybe the adults will say, no, what are you doing? Like that to them. They say, okay, what are you doing? They say, you know, what you be? We always say, what are you being? What is being right now? That is a cultural notion of time and space, it hadn't gone anywhere, it's still with us, even though we don't even know we're using it. See? So recognizing what is actually happening, brain-wise, is a big part of what I do. And so I created a curriculum, we used drums, we used, uh, we used a different method of teaching language and math, which was it's sort of like, if you understand about dance, like how do black people learn how to dance, right? It's something we're all very familiar with. Black people do not learn dancing step by step. That's not how we learn dance. You look at the person dancing, you incorporate the moves into your brain system, and then you produce those moves holistically all at once. Not once, not one move. Like this, you know how they got moves. Straight a stair and then look, one, two, and then move your foot, you know, that's not us. That's not how we do it. Our brains are not informa are processing information that way either. Right? So what happens is the public school system, because it's stripped down to these step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step approach, it actually slows down the brain of children, and especially black children. So when we say, well, Johnny's having trouble in school, we'd rather put the problem on Johnny 
say he's got a problem rather than realizing the method is all this stuff. It's not the right method. So that's what we did. All my children, my children were two, two to five grades ahead of public school. Is this methodology dealing with what they call like meta programs today? How people once again perceive some people can deal with sameness better than others. Some deal with difference better than others. Some people have a ability to deal with more than just sameness and yeah. difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, again, it's that's a way of entering an understanding of what it is that we're doing, but it's a little bit more complicated because it's really based on an idea of a multi-dimensional self. Which is a frame of reference that's not even part of Western culture. Which goes back more to the invisible, which is considered the, invisible, that's the right. spiritual. Yes. In language terms. So. In language terms. And so, uh, for example, emotions, we don't think of emotions as spiritual, but that's spiritual. You don't see it. You experience it, but you don't see it. Right? So, inclination, motivation, you don't see that. You feel the effects of it. You can't really find it. Nobody can find it and say what caused it at a physical level. See, these are all spiritual. So this is the same thing with creation, dancing, and just being the thought occurs, you picture it, and then you manifest it to be right. through speech or through action. Exactly. Exactly. And if you multiply that then times the various dimensions, then you get to how do you live? Right. Are you actually living out your true self? No. Or are you trapped on level three? You might be living out on level five. Right, but you might be trapped on level three. Most black people are trapped on level two, emotions. When you oppress people, terrorize them, traumatize them, we know what that produces in a person, right? So we have people walking around looking like on the surface that they're not traumatized and terrorized, and they are. So on another level, something else is going on. True, similar to Michael cutting his nose or a young person yeah. that has trouble reading and then the children jumps on them and then it's like, I don't want to do it or I don't, I'm yeah. not even going to try because of what people are going to do yeah. to them for that. Yeah, all kinds of all kinds of little issues like that are going on all the time. Yeah. And, and emotional states too, extreme states like depression, anxiety, and even insanity. Okay, so one and thing so called hyperactivity. Now one thing we've been dealing with a lot in the black community lately, which is unheard of most of the time because people keep your finger over the mouth about it, is pedophilia and pedophilia. Right, absolutely. And what that does to the youth of today. Right. right. In the past, and we've talked today about the crack act they're making the crack baby and then them having children and how this... Absolutely. Talk to us about I, some of that stuff. I am amazed, brother, I'm amazed that you bring that up. That is the one of the most crucial issues that we are not paying attention to, not addressing, dodging, and we just have a crazy legacy coming out of that. Uh, you know, we forget how far back this all goes. You know, you're talking about hundreds of years. You're talking about intergenerational transfer of trauma. Like people were raped 300 years ago and the effects of the raping is still coming out through their family patterns. And that's what I meant by that multi-dimensional self. One of the dimensions of the self is the inherited aspects of psychology, not just physiology. Yeah, you get certain body parts that come too with it, but it's more than just physical. DNA is not physical. When we talk about DNA, we're talking about the physical representation of something, 
But what's going through that DNA is not physical. That's spiritual. That's energy. That's energy in a pattern, so it's not just energy. It's energy that is in a certain pattern. And those patterns will evolve under duress, under trauma. As, as our elders would say, depending on how you are, that uh, he's like so and so, or he comes in the spirit of so and so. Yeah, right. right. Because these things are in his DNA or her DNA. Yeah, right. Exactly. He exactly. passed just like so and so, or he's this and that. Yeah, so you have, you have, uh, if you can imagine, I'm going to put it this way, and this is the way I describe it, and this is the way I think about it. So when you go back to the issue of pedophilia, the first question that should come up is, what makes a person do that? Hmm? What actually is the spirit of that? On that note. Which I'm going to suggest to you is a vampire spirit. That. That person is feeding off of the energy of that young person. That energy is a vital energy. Sexuality is the vital energy of life that creates life. So that's a superpower. And I said definition that people are powers with an S, right? So that power is activated through that engagement and it's activated in a way that that child is in no way able to manage at all so now it's been kicked in in a certain way so it's like the movies I mean you know when a vampire bites you then you become a vampire you know? and so uh, you know one of the things as a psychologist talking to people who have been uh, abused you know one of the interesting things that you see that so everybody doesn't act on their experience of it, right? So, but amazingly, you'd be surprised the number of people who have been abused as children sexually who then are tormented in their minds that they are going to become abusers, even though in their heart they have no intention of doing anything like that. But it's on their mind, they're constantly, so they be walking around you look, again, on the outside, you can't tell that. They look like normal people. They're trying to get, get by the best they can. Internally, they can't sleep at night because they're thinking, what if I become one of those people? You see? On their mind. It's on their mind. You see? So we have, uh, you know, we have uh, failed to acknowledge that a lot of this came out of the church. You know, uh, the big deal with Pope, the new Pope, how he got the new Pope, because the old Pope was under pressure because there was so much of that going on in the Catholic Church and uh, nobody, nobody could deal with it. The Catholic Church couldn't deal with it, the Pope couldn't deal with it, the bishops couldn't deal with it, a lot of them were part of it, right? And so uh, we, we are so far locked into all of this matrix of lies, so far in it that we can't even break and say, how do you explain that the Catholic priest is the rapist? How do you explain that? This person supposedly is like all in touch with God and very religious and, you know, pure. He's the actual devil. Okay, now, it'd be one thing if we were talking about one. We're not talking about one. We're talking about whores of priests that abuse children. How do you explain that? What is the cause of that? We haven't, we, they haven't stopped and really faced ourselves and say, we got a problem that we need to look at. See? So you see, like in my type of work, um, it comes up all the time, because that's like one of the main questions that I ask people. You know, I go through my list, you know, have you ever, had hallucinations, you ever saw something that wasn't happening, or heard voices, I go through all that, you ever been molested? You know, it's just a basic question. You know, numbers are skyrocketing. They're skyrocketing. Okay, so now let me ask you, because I don't know how much you get around and hear stuff on the internet, but there's been a situation in the African American community caused by same Catholic-like situation with 
Africa been by. Zulu Nation, Planet Rock, Hip Hop. They said this man was a pederast and he was tormenting young men throughout the Bronx River projects for 46 years or so. Mm -hmm. And now it's been coming out in the community. That's why we've been talking about it more over the internet and different things and mm -hmm. stuff. Tell us how you would see this dealing with the the spirit and the minds and the hearts of the people of the community with something like this happening, coming out. How do we as a people deal with this in our community now? Similar to, as you say, the Pope and yeah. the priests. Yeah, well, again, uh, we have been naive and in denial about the actual effects of the slavery period. We just in denial. We are in denial about the fact that the way that we see the world is really through a pair of eyes of a liar that have been given to us to see the world so that we don't see what actually has happened and therefore is happening. That's the first point. That every time we want to ask a question about our behavior, we fail to put it into context. Except the context has been handed to us by the slave master. Right? And that's why I said we won't even ask the question, well, what is the relationship between being religious and being a pedophile? But there's a relationship. And what is the relationship between being a Christian religion and being a pedophile? That's too scary for a lot of people. What does that mean, you see? So I don't know all the details about Africa Bombay. I heard some rumblings about that. Um, but I certainly know from my work, many people who have been in that situation. I've had people uh, talk to me about how they molest the children. And when they talk about it, they are tormented by it. But they also talk about the fact that they can't control themselves. And I'm saying understanding a human being and how power works through a human being, I understand how that works. And it's very much like if I put it on a physical level and say so-and-so has sex with so-and-so, it doesn't matter what age are. Okay, and they had syphilis, and then next thing I know, the person they had sex with also has syphilis. And then the next thing I know, whoever they had sex with has syphilis. Imprinting process. You follow that part? Imprinting Now, process. just because we can identify an organism, oh, it's a spirochete, they call it, right? That is transferred from person to person to person to person. That originally came from a young one. It really wasn't a human condition. See, that's the part we forget, that syphilis wasn't something that humans had. Europeans introduced syphilis to the world when they had sex with animals in, in South America. Prior to that, there was no syphilis among humans. See? So, something happened when that organism was transferred from the original host to a human host. Now it's passed on down. I'm saying the same thing is happening here. We just, it's like science fiction. It's just hard for us to grab it. That something non-human has happened. A non-human process has now become transferred into the humans and the humans are acting it out. And it is a vampire. So pedophilia is actually, a, at a spiritual level, it is actually an STD. It's a spiritual STD. So, African Bambada, I would say, I bet you if you go into his history, you're going to find out what he was doing was something that was done to him. If he was doing that, I can't say I wasn't there. But if he was doing it like that, if there's a long pattern, for example, say, well, it wasn't just a person, it's several people. Again, that's what you'll see. you see these patterns, right? Showing that this is compulsive. 
It's not thought out. It's not something that, okay, I'm going to go and do this. It's something they can't stop from doing. Right? Him and whoever. When I first came to grad school here, um, I had a case of a young boy, an African-American male, about 10 years old, that had been molested by his Boy Scout uh, person, his troop leader. And it's weird because the way I found out, he had drawn a picture, because you know, we use pictures a lot to help. So I saw the picture. About two weeks later, I get another boy, same age, African-American male, same clinic, and I'm talking to him, and he's having problems, and I happen to draw a picture, and damn if he doesn't draw the same picture. And I thought, well, that's curious. I didn't even believe in this drawing stuff back then. I was just this grad student, you know. And I said, let's, this, this kid drew something just like that other kid I had a couple weeks ago. Brought it to my uh, advisor. The advisor says, hmm, I think they live in the same community. Turned out that they did. Turned out they both were in the Boy Scouts. Turned out they both had been molested by the Boy Scout leader. Turned out the Boy Scout leader had molested about 50 other boys. You see, this is a compulsive behavior. It's not something we can understand in a moral sense, like we try to understand this morality, this it has nothing to do with that. This is energetic. This is not thought process like we think psychological. Thought is just one aspect of human power. This is not at the thought level. This is actually at the sexual level. This is like an STD of energy. That's what it is. And the point is, are we going to face it? Or are we going to try to act and pretend like it's not as bad as it is? No, it is as bad as it is. And out of that came the confusion over sexuality. This is where you get these people who are not sure what sex they belong to and they're trying to figure it out. And this is where it's all coming from. And it's, that's not the popular answer, I know. I know that. But this is, this is where it's coming from. Okay. If you had a person and they said, I feel like I'm a cow. Nobody's going to go out and try to promote that they should be allowed to live as a cow. They're going to be like, but you're not a cow. <laughs> Cut it out, you know. If you're born a male, and then but you're confused, and I think, but I feel like a female. But those are feelings, but that doesn't make you a female. So the answer to that oh, well, just do a sex change or whatever. You can do that, but that's all denial. We're just in denial when we, we deal with stuff like this. We don't understand what sex is. First of all, what is sex? Is? We don't understand what that is. Hetero, whatever. We don't even understand what it is. Gender, we don't know what gender is. Our people understood this. We, we had whole mythologies to explain what gender is, what sex is. We, we're totally out of touch with that as a people, I'm saying. So that's why when you go to, like now, many places around the world, certain corners of the world, it's like very low tolerance for that kind of ambiguity. And you know, and everybody wants to look at those people and say, well, they're stuck in the past, or, you know, they're uh, being anti-whatever, you know, uh, homophobic, which is a term that somebody made up that really has, it doesn't really have any real meaning other than the political use that it's used. No, those people have a cultural anchoring that tells them what gender is and the fact that you cannot get rid of gender. You don't get to vote on gender. Gender is nature. Gender is the fact that the universe operates off of principles, plus and minus, up and down, yes and no, male and female, positive and negative. Positive and negative. That's what gender is. You can't get rid of it. You can change and try to do all kinds of stuff you want to do. You can't get rid of this invisible principle, though. But we're far from that. We don't, we don't have our definitions anymore. So how can we deal with after Barbada and this madness when we don't even know what sanity is anymore? We think sanity is something you can vote on. That's one of the things I learned from studying African culture. You don't get to vote on reality. 
It's about understanding and not voting. What tapping, is it? Tapping into it and using it. Tapping into it and using it, being, being aligned with it versus against it. Right. All right, so I would like to ask, like, sum it up and everything, but before summing it up, do you consider Islam, Christianity, and things of this nature, as a doctor being, once we're saying, an out of African spirituality system that's been tainted and corrupted? Right. So, let me say that many people are very preoccupied with searching for a belief system. Something that they can accept as probably true and something to believe in. That in and of itself is false. So when you look in the tradition of life on this planet, people did not have a belief system searching for something to believe in. They simply observed reality and then they codified it in these stories, these mythologies, which is about physics. So what emerges over time are political structures that have some of that information in it, but then it's tainted, yes, it's, it's altered for political reasons. So uh, I'm not really a, a person that's too fond of religion. I study all the religions, and uh, the foundation of all of them makes sense to me, but I also understand that uh, much of the truth, you know, we talk about esoteric versus exoteric traditions where people think that the things that they're taught is what the religion is about. In fact, it's about a mystery of information that's underneath what's being taught, see? So if you don't get that, uh, then you're going to miss the point. And so uh, the way that it's taught, it's often taught by people who don't get it. So it's, it's not taught that way. So something as simple as, uh, you know, it doesn't matter where we, we, we could go, and I did, you know, find the history and the origin of all these different things, you know. So, but like, uh, at one point, in, as a young man, uh, I started reading the Bible. You know, I grew up in a Judeo-Christian tradition, and uh, I started reading the Bible just to understand it. And I was amazed at how a lot of it wasn't what I had been taught in church, you know. And uh, something as simple as the book of Genesis, which is the very beginning of it, by the time you get to chapter 6, Genesis 1 through 6, there's a whole lot of stuff that's explained about this planet on, in those chapters, and yet none of that really was taught in the church. When it, and when it says in there, and people know that it says this and still don't see it, and it says, that the Lord God had told Eve and Adam not to partake of this particular tree and the snake came and broke it off for her and told her, hey, he's lying, he's tricking you. Because if you partake of this tree, this tree of knowledge, it tells you right this tree of knowledge, if you take this knowledge then you will become as God to know good and evil. What is the deal there? The deal there is that there's something there that is awakening this human being. And once a human being is awake, awakened, then there's a revelation. And the revelation was that the God, Lord God, that had been ruling over Adam and Eve was actually an evil God. That was the whole point. If they didn't have the knowledge of good and evil, then they can never distinguish what's evil and what's not. And so then they know that the God that was ruling of them was actually the evil God. Hello. Now I went back and said, where did this story come from? Go back to the Ethiopian Coptic text before the Romans got a hold to it and before the church fathers changed it and all that. And that book called Adam and Eve. And in that book, it's just straight up raw. Welcome to hell. Now I find out why the why, why hell came from. Like this, this place. Right? So that we're trying to get out of here. We're supposed to get out of here. We're not supposed to be comfortable here. We're supposed to be growing ourselves up as gods to get out of here. And that is what the teaching is. That's not what they teach in church. I don't care which, which tradition. So, 
Yeah, he's right, Dr. Ben, of course, he's right. Dr. Ben being way back, being a person that looked into the origins of all these things. And that's the only way to get there. That's why I had the books for it. If you know origin, then you can see the tricks. You can see what happened. So I go back to origins, go back to language. Why do we say what we say? What does it mean? If it's in Latin, why did the, why did the Roman Catholic Church use Latin as its language when it wasn't the language of the people? The people, they were, they were Italians or Romans. They had a language and it wasn't Latin. So why did the church fathers use Latin? And why didn't they only speak it in the church? Et cetera, et cetera. There's a reason. It didn't just happen. There's a reason. Right? So until we learn these origins, then we're stuck with trying to believe in something. I tell everybody all the time, I mean, you come up in the morning and get up and you go out to the sun and you feel the rays of the sun and how it feels. You look around and you see all the thing in nature is oriented towards the sun and bound to the sun. You, know? you don't have to believe that. It's not about belief. You have an experience. So, is sunlight traveling through space and is it taking eight minutes to get from the sun to the earth? Is that true? Is it really 80,000 miles away? And so and these are all things that we it's just... the earth around the flesh. You know, <laughs> we, we take these things and we don't actually stop and say, well, let me investigate this. Is a star, you know, a star is 150,000 light years away. Really? Is that true? Well, I'm over here in my neural psych class and they're talking about how the eye is working, how light has to pass through that little circle of the pupil and stimulate, interact with nerves and then send a signal to your brain that there's something out there. So if I'm looking at a star and I see the star and my brain is telling me there's a star, then the star is not far away at all. The star is in my fucking eyeball. Because it's got to be in there to, to talk to my brain to let my brain know that I exist. You see what I'm saying? And now we're into the problem of time and space. Right? Like, is it really time at all? Or is this space at all? Or is it just that we just accept this stuff and just go on? And even though we go right on Sunday and even though our ancestors told us there's no time or space, there's only the infinite now. That's it. We go and read that and leave there and still believe it's nonsense. Then that teaches us to have the concept of the limited self. And that now we're separate from the God. We can read about the God in a religion rather than imbued by the God to become the God, even though the religion tells you that's the point. That's where we're supposed to be headed. And they ask, and they ask the master, uh, you know, when, when, he, me, when the master asked the people that were stoning him, why do you stone me? Because of these great works that I do. And they said, no, not because of the great works that you do, but that you, a man, claim to be God. And the master said, but I told you it's written in your law that ye are gods. Are you getting mad at me now when I tell you ye are God? I said, we are God. We are it. We just have a very limited view of our own reality because somebody else redefined it for us. Yes, I am that I am. I am that I am. Yes. To embrace that, I am that I am, is to leave slavery. Once I know that I am, then nobody can hold me back. I'm not that. I'm not, not that. I am whatever I choose to become. I am the power behind it. I am the process that causes it. I am the substance of the expression that presents itself as it. I cannot be separated from that. As soon as we know that and we live that, nobody can hold us in slavery. Those that captured us know this. That's why they have to teach us something else. The Matrix. All right, well, I appreciate the come home. Yes, sir. Hopefully that's something you can use. Thank you, Bob. All right, bro. Good to see you. The kids.